Welcome to Manoa Community Church. My name is Pastor Stefan Bomberger, and I'm so glad you joined us online for worship today. If it's your first Sunday worshiping with us, please go ahead and follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our channel on YouTube so you can worship with us every Sunday at 10 a.m. We're presently in a series, a teaching series called Global Outbreak. It's on fear, faith, and COVID-19. Today we have a special message called Wisdom While Suffering out of the book of Job. Also, at the end of worship today, we're going to take communion together. So I hope you have the bread, wine, or juice ready to take that. But if not, sometime during the service today, quick run to your kitchen to grab the elements for communion at the end of the service. I'll lead us through that together. So let's go to the Lord. We're going to sing some songs of praise together, but let me pray for us and invite God's presence into our hearts and into our homes. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we declare that our hope is built on you. Nothing less, Jesus, than your blood and your righteousness. And we pray as we come into your presence this morning that you would fill our hearts, fill our homes with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray as we draw near to you, God, that you would draw near to us, and that you would receive our worship, Lord, that as we worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would fill us with your power and your presence. Be exalted, be glorified through these songs of praise, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this hymn together. My hope. My hope is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. My hope is built.
dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne Come on, let's lift our voice, sing this. Praise the Lord, what an awesome song. I raise a hallelujah. 
Can you raise a hallelujah in the midst of what you're going through right now? Can you lift up holy hands and give God some glory, some honor and praise in spite of what it looks like? He's still worthy to be praised. Amen? Well, let's enter into corporate prayer. Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes as we look to the Lord who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could think or even ask. Father, we come to you even right now thanking you for our last night lying down and our early morning rising. We thank you that mercy met us, grace kissed us. We thank you even right now, God, for another opportunity to be here on a Sunday to worship you. God, it may not be in Manoa Church building, but God, here we are looking on the screens, God, realizing and recognizing that you got the power to move through the screen and touch us where we at. And God, we do look to you, God, because all of our help comes from you who made heaven and earth. God, we look to you, God, even right now for deliverance from COVID-19. We know you got the power to do it, and we got the faith to believe it. God, we trust you. We put all our hope in you, and we ask even right now, God, that you would heal those that are experiencing COVID-19. God, heal those that are on ventilators right now, God. Heal those that are in nursing homes right now, God, in the name of Jesus. And we ask for protection over our first, uh, over the nurses and the doctors, Lord, over police officers, Lord, over firemen, God, that have to uh, go out in the midst of all this COVID-19. We ask that you protect them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, we bless you in advance. We magnify you in advance, God. We give you glory in advance, God. We worship you in advance, God. We have not seen COVID-19 in yet, God, but God, you are so good. You are so great. God, you're so powerful and you're so mighty that, God, you can just blink at COVID-19 and it will end. God, you can point a finger at it, God. You can dispatch angels, God. You can just speak a word to it, God. So, God, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give a praise. And we ask, God, that your perfect will be done. Not our will be done, but your will be done, God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Well, before we have our public reading of scripture, Pastor Stephen has a few announcements that he needs to make. Amen? Well, thank you, Pastor Ron. We do have a couple brief announcements. The first announcement is going to be made by Joe Gormley, one of our college interns about our youth ministry. Go ahead, Joe. Hello, Manoa. My name is Joe. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of three youth interns at our church, and I wanted to say that youth group is still meeting. Uh, we will be meeting today and every Sunday after today at 11.30 a.m., and for those of you who are on the email list, you've already received the Zoom link, but for those of you who aren't on the email list and would like to be on it, uh, please feel free to email me at joe at manoa.org. Um, feel free to send me any questions, any comments, any concerns, um, or just reach out. So thank you. All right, students, we'll see you at 1130 today. Also, for our children's ministry, just a reminder, parents, that every Sunday at 1130, we have our Zoom children's ministry for Kingdom Kids as well. If you don't have that secure link, reach out to us at kingdomkids.manoa.org. We'd be happy to send you the secure link. So that's today and every Sunday at 1130. Next, we have the National Day of Prayer this Thursday, this Thursday, May 7th. So we have a brief video that I want to show you about the National Day of Prayer. Hey guys, Pastor Stefan here from Manoa Community Church. Ed Crenshaw, pastor of Victory Church. Hi, I'm Phil Capuccio of Sound of the Trumpet Ministries with my wife, Denise. Hi, my name is Pastor Kells. I've been assigned the responsibility and the task of praying for awakening and revival in our land. This message is a prayer for all service members that are out there serving in our armed forces. We join me as I pray for those who are ill today. I have the privilege of praying for the church. Let's pray for our government officials. I'm gonna pray for unity. Lord, I cover myself with the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord God, that as we endure this hardship as a nation, that we would expect from it a harvest of righteousness and peace. 
peace. We come in the name of Jesus, and right now we agree for a great spiritual awakening all across America. Amen. Church, let's join this Thursday, May 7th, for the National Day of Prayer. The final announcement is the Vision Tour. We're on Lesson 3. has been rolled out and uploaded onto our website, which is called Unity, Liberty, and Charity. And it's on the beliefs that define us as a local church. If this is your first Sunday worshiping with us, the Vision Tour is an introduction to our vision, values, mission, and membership. And so the third of four lessons has been uploaded. The final lesson will be uploaded next week. But you can jump in anytime. Just go to manoa.org forward slash vision tour. There you can download the PDF manual that goes through the entire class. And I walk through all the values of the church, all the beliefs of the church, and what our mission is together fulfilling the Great Commission. So I hope that you go through that class with me online. And of course, if you'd like to join Manoa Community Church as a member before we reopen our doors, just reach out to me at stefan at manoa.org. I'd be happy to facilitate that. At this time, we're going to do our public reading of scriptures. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Job chapter 42. Job 42, Onika and her new husband, Chris, are going to do our scripture reading for us. Go ahead, guys. Good morning, Manoa family. From Onika and Christopher. Today we're going to be reading from Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 7 in the King James Version. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Verse seven, and it was so that after the Lord has spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. We ask that God add a blessing to the reading of his word We thank God for the sovereign will and the sovereignty that he shows in this scripture. Um, Job did not sin uh, to cause a punishment, but what he did do is um, he, he didn't believe or trust the sovereign will of God. And for that, he repented and God did favor him because of that. So we thank you for your time and we wish you a blessed and a happy day. Remember, stay safe. Well, thank you, Onika and Chris. They actually got married yesterday. So congratulations, guys, as well. We love you both. Now, if you would, open a few chapters earlier to Job chapter one. Today, we're going to be preaching through the book of Job as we talk about wisdom while suffering as part of our global outbreak series today. Wisdom is something that we all need, and the Bible is full of wisdom. We have the book of Proverbs that teaches us about sowing and reaping and how if we're diligent, we prosper. We have the book of Ecclesiastes that truthfully tells us about some of the futility in life and how life can be like a vapor or a mist. Well, the book of Job fits into that wisdom literature, and it speaks to the issue of suffering. And there's a lot of mystery in suffering because God is good and God is all powerful. There is a real devil, as we'll see Satan in the book of Job as well. And these things all converge and it wrestles with the question of God's justice. And is the world fair? And the answers in the book of Job, I'll be honest, aren't always the greatest answers for us. We read through it and they're not the most satisfying, but they are wise. And they instruct us how to relate to one another and how to relate to God in the midst of our suffering. Because as Ron preached a few weeks ago, storms are inevitable. Suffering is inevitable in this world on this side of eternity. We're not in heaven yet, so suffering is here 
How do we relate to one another? How do we relate to God in the midst of our suffering? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to give you five principles from the book of Job on how to walk through suffering with wisdom. So let's pray, ask God to bless his word as his preached, and then we're going to walk through the book of Job together. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. And your word says in the book of James, if we lack wisdom to ask you for it, Lord. We confess we don't understand everything in the world, Lord. We don't understand the suffering around us, but we resolve to trust you like Job. And Lord, I pray that we would never give pat answers in the midst of suffering, but that we would seek to honor you as men and women of integrity in the midst of suffering and to care for one another as we suffer. So speak to us through the book of Job and grant us your wisdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get started just by reading the first couple verses of the book of Job. Verse one, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that one of my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So we're introduced to the character of Job as a man who fears God. He's upright. He's described as blameless. He's one of the most prosperous. He is one of the greatest people in the ancient Near East. And here is a man that not only fears God, but takes good care of his children. He's concerned if they're sinning or not. So he sacrifices in the Old Testament sense of that on behalf of them to offer atonement for their sin. Job is introduced to us as a really good guy. And that's why the book of Job is so surprising and so shocking to us. Because Job is introduced to all kinds of suffering that don't make sense in his life. And we're actually introduced to God in his throne room in the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2, where God is on his heavenly throne with the court around him, with all these angelic beings. And who walks into God's courtroom but Satan the accuser himself. And Satan walks up to God and he says, the only reason that Job fears you, the only reason that Job loves you, the only reason that Job worships you and lives so well is because you've blessed him so much. You have put a hedge of protection around this guy so that nothing can touch him. That is why Job is so obedient to you. That is why Job lives such a good life. And God says, now, you can take away all of those blessings and let's see what happens. So it's, it's kind of a crazy thing where the Lord actually allows Satan to befall Job's life and take away the blessings in his life. And so the rest of chapter one, you'll see in verses 13 through 19, four people run up to Job and they say, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, fire fell from heaven and consumed all your livestock and the sword fell upon all of your servants. And the final one comes up to him and he says, there was a great wind and it blew over the house where your children were out. All of them are dead. All of them are gone. Your children have died. What a heartbreaking thing for anybody to walk through. This wealthy man all of a sudden loses all of his wealth and loses all of his children. And we see in verse 20, and look at this. It says, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshiped. Wow. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Satan approaches God again. And look at this. He says in verse Three, he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me, God says against Satan, against him to destroy him without reason. Look at this, verse four, Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. 
but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, surprisingly, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And listen to this. His wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Here's the first principle from the book of Job as we walk through suffering with wisdom. Wisdom while suffering holds fast your integrity. It holds fast your integrity. And that's lifted right out of the Bible. In the heavenly scene, he says he still holds fast his integrity. His wife comes up to him and foolishly says, are you still holding fast your integrity? And Job says, yes. Who I was when I had all of my blessings is who I really am. There's an integrity in my life. It's not simply because I have all of these things. I have all of these kids. I have all of this money. I have all of these servants that I bless the Lord, that I worship God. I am a person of integrity. And we're walking through some great suffering right now. And the book of Job would show us in the midst of our suffering, it will expose who we really are. Are we people of integrity? And wisdom says, if this was removed from me, I would still bless God. I would still worship God. I don't worship God simply because of his blessings. I worship God because he's God. And he's the creator. Naked I came into this world. Even if I leave this world naked, I will still bless the Lord. The first principle from the book of Job, wisdom while suffering holds fast your integrity. The second thing wisdom while suffering does is extends sympathy and comfort. So this is not what we do when we're suffering. This is what we should do to other people while they're suffering. Look at verses 11 to the end of the chapter. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shunite, and Zophar the Nehemathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him, to show Job sympathy and comfort him. Well done thus far, guys. Verse 12, when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. That's signs of grieving and remorse. Verse 13, and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his suffering was very great. If the book of Job would stop here, in many ways, this would be the greatest conclusion that these friends could have ever done. We're going to see through the book of Job that Job foibles and then they foible, and most of the book is then them going back and forth and debating and going on a sin hunt with Job. But what we see up front, what they do for a whole week, is they go just to comfort Job. They don't go to try to fix Job. They don't try to go to speak into it. Husbands, I know that myself included, we're guilty when our wives are suffering or struggling. Mr. Fix-It wants to come out and offer all of this advice. Tell somebody how they can make life better. All they really offered him was the ministry of their presence. And that was the best thing that they could have done. They sat there and they wept with Job. In the midst of suffering, people don't need answers necessarily. They need to know that you love them and that you care and that you come to be with them. Because a lot of Job's friends have abandoned him, we'll find out later in the book. A lot of Job's friends have walked away from him. His friends and families now abhor him. But these guys have come there and initially they come through strong. The Bible would tell us to extend sympathy and care in the midst of our affliction where they actually get it wrong in the book of Job and where Job gets it wrong is where they start speaking into the situation, trying to discover the secrets of heaven and why this is going on. You and I are interestingly, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit in this book, given an insight into the throne room of heaven that they do not have, that Job does not have. 
They don't understand the workings of the devil or God in this instance. All they see is the affliction and they're trying to make sense of it. But it seems very senseless. Intentionally, in fact, the book of Job introduces it largely as a senseless form of suffering in his life. So in the midst of suffering, the thing that we want to do is extend sympathy and comfort. The third thing that we want to do, wisdom while suffering, is to avoid speculations and accusations. Avoid speculations and accusations. This is chapters 3 through 37. Yes, most of the book of Job. You might be asking, why is Pastor Stephen preaching a whole book of the Bible in one sermon? If you read through all of those chapters, you can't really preach them because most of the things they say sound good and most of the things that they say are 100% untrue. That's right. You heard me right. There's things in the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit that are true when you get to the end and realize that they were false. Does that make sense? And so you can't preach those chapters and then tell you to live this way because the things that they are saying are are wrong, but they sound right. So we have these characters. The first thing that invites this speculation, Job laments his birth. You see this in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night that said, a man is conceived. Job understandably says, man, I wish I was never born. That's how bad this has gotten. I wish that I just never saw the light of day. His suffering has gotten very bad. He's lost all of his children. His wife has turned against him. All of his wealth is gone. And he says, I don't even want to live anymore. And that's where his comforting friends turn against him. His friends now, one after the other in this book, they go after Job and they go after him on a sin hunt to speculate and accuse Job why this suffering must be happening in his life. You and I know from chapter one that he's a blameless man, an upright man. He hasn't done anything wrong. But they are operating out of the principles, probably largely like the book of Proverbs, of sowing and reaping and saying, bad things have happened to Job, so Job has done bad things. I just want to read some of these from the various friends. Eliphaz says, As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Job, you live in a world of sowing and reaping. You have plowed iniquity and you are reaping iniquity. You have sowed trouble and you are reaping trouble. Job, let's be honest. God is just. Therefore, this must be his justice against you. We know that's wrong, but there is a principle in other wisdom literature of sowing and reaping, but it's being wrongly applied in this situation. See, that's the way that wisdom works. There's some truth in the Bible like John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. Truth like that works 100% of the time. You believe in Jesus Christ and you will have everlasting life. But wisdom helps you look at the world and try to discern things. But you can't always claim them 100% like there's a sowing and reaping and every time something bad happens, it's because you did something bad. That's a misapplication of that scripture. So Eliphaz is wrong. Bildad in chapter 8 verse 4 says, If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. What a horrible thing to say to your friend. If your children have sinned, implied in that is of course they've sinned because they're all dead. If your children have sinned against him, he, God, has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. Your kids are getting what they deserve for their sin, Job. That's why all of them are dead. Zophar says in chapter 20, verse 29, this is the wicked man's portion from God. This is what you're getting, Job, because you're wicked. He is a man of integrity, but after their prodding and after defending himself, he starts to go a little bit crazy. He's not sure. He's not sure what to think of all of this. 
Really, we as the readers should struggle with to think of this, right? Is the world fair? Why is this happening to Job? Because this doesn't appear to be a fair thing to happen to this man. And, but this is what Zophar says to him, you're wicked, this is your portion, which is false. Elihu is a fourth friend that appears later at the end. And he emerges and he says, you three are a bunch of bozos. Job, you're wrong too. And he's the youngest of them all, but he comes and he's pretty confident that he's got God figured out and he's got the world figured out. So he wants a chance to speak as well. Chapter 34, verse seven and eight, he says, what man is like Job who drinks up scoffing like water, who travels in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men. In the midst of suffering, we're gonna be tempted to try to figure out why we're suffering. We're gonna be tempted to figure out what this person did that was wrong. In the midst of COVID-19, have you noticed that there's a lot of speculation right now on why this is happening? There's a lot of speculation on who's at fault for this and to accuse different people, accuse different nations. I would like to encourage you, church, don't be like Job's friends in the midst of suffering. There are things at work in the world that are so much bigger than us that we cannot fully understand. And it's really, really unhelpful in the midst of them. Wisdom would say not to accuse and not to speculate. We don't fully know why this is happening, but we best not try to connect dots that God has not connected for us. In the midst of suffering, it's much better to extend sympathy and care than to speculate and bring accusations. Which leads us to our fourth point. Wisdom while suffering recognizes your limited perspective. Recognizes your limited perspective. This comes out of chapters 38 through 41. This is where God himself comes into the narrative and speaks directly to Job out of a whirlwind. In verse two, as he comes in the whirlwind, he says to Job, who is this? that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. He says to Job and really to their friends, he says, you guys don't have the knowledge to understand what you're talking about. Your understanding is limited. Your perspective is limited. Verse three, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, etc., etc. And essentially what God does with Job then is he takes him on a virtual tour of the entire cosmos. And he rapid fire gives Job 77 questions. Surely you know who feeds these animals. Surely you know where this came from. Surely you know where that came from. Surely you know all things, Job. Don't you know everything, Job? And of course the answer is, I have no clue what you're talking about, God. I love this. This is one of the oldest books in the Bible and it has revelation about things in creation that otherwise the ancients probably would have known nothing about we get a snapshot of great sea creatures that even today with our cameras, we can rarely get down and get pictures of these things. We get pictures of the birds. We get pictures of all the different animals. We get pictures of creation itself. And God just takes him and takes us on a rapid tour to say, your perspective is just so small. I am governing the entire universe down to the follicles on every person's head, up to the nations and raising and taking down kings, setting up and establishing people down to the very families and children that are being born. I am governing all of these things and it is far beyond your understanding or perspective to understand what is going on. In chapter 40, verses one through five, he picks it up again after Job uh, says, oh, I'm done, I'm done. He says, the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer. And listen to what Job says. Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind again and buckle up, Job, here we go again. And I said at the outset of today's sermon 
the answer that God gives us from this wisdom literature is an important answer. It's not necessarily the answers that we're seeking. We want to understand why bad things happen to good people. We want to understand why evil is permitted in the world. We want to understand why the devil is allowed to exist at all. We don't get those answers from the book of Job. And many of those answers we don't get from the Bible itself. But we do get a picture of the majesty and the greatness of God and the smallness of our understanding. And God says, your perspective is far too limited to understand or trace out these things. So stop trying and stop questioning. I think of last week's sermon with Joseph. Isn't it awesome that God pulls back the curtain and connects all the dots for us so that we see why the bad things happen to Joseph? But here's the reality. Most of our lives, we don't get the revelation from heaven to connect those dots. And it's very foolish for you and I to start to connect them on our own and suppose that we see how they all connect. Because God is up to something so much bigger than any of us can see. And maybe some of the things that God is up to go beyond even the generation that we are even living in right now. God is from eternity to eternity, from beginning to end, and everything is working together for a huge purpose and plan. And God is taking care of the human race and every creature on this planet and all of the stars and all of the planets and all of the universe with all of the laws. And it's a small thing for God to do. And yet when you and I want to understand how everything works together, the answer that the Lord gives us from the book of Job is, don't find fault with me. You won't understand and you cannot understand these things. We need to recognize our limited perspective. That's what wisdom does in the midst of suffering. It doesn't try to connect all the dots. It says, my understanding is limited. I know who I worship. I know that he is great. I know that he is loving. I know that he is merciful. I know that there's a bigger plan at work but I have no clue how this all fits together. So I trust him in the midst of my suffering. The fifth and final lesson that we get from the book of Job as it relates to wisdom while suffering is to anticipate God's future grace. Anticipate God's future grace. Chapter 42, Job answered the Lord, verse two, I know that you can do all things that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will make it known to me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Verse 7 and the Lord has spoken these words to Job. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And this is what happens at the end of the book. God calls him to sacrifice for the forgiveness of his friend's sins, to pray and intercede on their behalf. And the very end of the book of Job is a surprise ending where God not only restores Job's fortune and family, but he blesses him far beyond what Job even had before, and he was already the greatest man in the East. And you look at that, and you kind of scratch your head and say, all right, Job was tested. Job walked through this test. His integrity was proved through this test, and yet God had a blessing ahead for Job that he wouldn't have anticipated. Honestly, me, the reader, would not have anticipated at the end he gives them all the blessings and more. And you look at that and say, in the end, God will do what is right. God is a God of justice. God is a God of mercy and grace. And God will do what is right, either in this life or as we always say in the next, when the day of judgment comes, God will right every wrong and correct every injustice in this world. And we look at our lives and we look at the suffering that we walk through. And I think the question that all of us ask in the midst of our suffering is not only where is God, but does God care? 
Does God care about my suffering? Not only does the book of Job, but the entire Bible emphatically says, yes. God cares about you and God cares about your suffering. In fact, there was one that walked this earth that was far more righteous and blameless than Job. It was God himself in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And he suffered unjustly in this world to right every wrong. And this one Christ was abandoned and rejected and accused even by his friends. And this one suffered unjustly in the world where people accused him of being a sinner even though he was not. And he died on the cross for your sins where his flesh not only suffered but where he physically died. And he rose from the dead victorious so that you could know as Job proclaims, my Redeemer lives and I will see him with my own eyes. Because the book of Job points beyond Job to the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God is not only the God in the heavenly courts, but he is the God that descends into our suffering and suffers unjustly to right every wrong. And the blessing at the end of the book of Job, I think is really a picture of heaven itself in the anticipation of as we walk through all the suffering in this life, there is a future grace. There is a future blessing that God holds out for all of us. And we can look through the corridors of the suffering and say, I don't see why all of this is happening. I don't understand. I'm not going to accuse and speculate about this, but I know the end of the story and it's going to work out good for me and all those who trust in Jesus Christ. And God, I know, cares about me in the midst of my suffering because if Jesus Christ himself could be afflicted by the devil, then he can walk with me through my suffering in this life into the next. Amen? Amen. Wisdom while suffering holds fast your integrity. We are godly people that worship the Lord, whether we have much or have little. It extends sympathy and comfort. When people are suffering, we weep with them. We cry with them. We don't try to fix it. Thirdly, we avoid speculation and accusations. Fourthly, we recognize our limited perspective. And fifthly, we anticipate God's future grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of the book of Job. And as I've said, Lord, I pray back to you, Lord. We, we recognize the mystery here. We recognize that there's suffering that really hurts and we cast that upon you. And we know that you took that pain upon yourself on the cross and Lord Jesus, that you are a sympathetic high priest. Lord, that you wept at Lazarus's tomb. And so God, in the midst of our suffering, help us to be good friends that weep with those that weep. Lord, and help us to be wise sufferers and use wisdom in how we relate to those who are suffering. Lord, make us wise people. Make us godly people. Make us men and women of integrity that hold fast to our integrity in the midst of suffering, we ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as promised, we're taking communion together today at the end of the service. Every first Sunday of the month, we take communion together. As I've shared before, it is unusual to take communion individually in our homes, but in the season, we think it's important to show our unity, not only in Christ, but with one another. And so in this season, obviously we're making exceptions to say, we're gonna take the bread and the cup and there's no distance in prayer and there's no distance in this time. We are together as we take communion. So know this as you're taking the bread and you're taking the wine, you're taking it not only with Manoa Community Church, but with the global church worshiping all over the world on this Lord's Day. At Manoa Community Church, communion's a meal that we share with all Christians who believe in Jesus Christ. So you don't have to be a member of Manoa Community Church to participate right now. If you're in good standing and baptized, belong to any church, then you are part of the, the Church of Jesus Christ with a capital C, then this is a family meal for all of us to participate in together. We are called to examine ourselves during this meal. So let's use this as an opportunity to confess our sins to the Lord, to receive his forgiveness, and to remember his broken body and blood. Let me pray over the elements in your home and here in the church and ask God to meet us during this time. Let's pray. 
Well, Father, we confess our sins to you now. And as we partake of this sacred meal, we declare to you that we are sinners, but we are forgiven sinners through the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would take these common elements, this bread and this wine, and set it apart now for the sacred purposes of your supper, Lord. That, Lord Jesus, you would spiritually meet with us in the bread and in the wine, that we would participate in the body and the blood of Christ. We thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins. And so right now we pause and just confess any known sins to you. Take a moment to do that. Amen. With the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, let's take the bread together. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. Let's pray again. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your shed blood. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. As we take this meal together today and with the church throughout all time, we declare that you are the Savior and you are our Savior, that we have an interest in your blood and that you have chosen and saved us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have through your body and through your blood. And we thank you that you suffered for us so that in the midst of our suffering, we know that you love us and that you care for us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's join our voices for one final song of praise. Let's sing of our Savior, the work he's done on our behalf. Let's lift our voices. Come on, sing it out. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows. Of my soul, amen. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Oh, Jesus, we love you, Lord. Who could imagine? Who could imagine? Great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken.
portion of our service where we can have an opportunity to give our offerings to the Lord online. There is a QR code that will be up on the screen after the benediction for a minute or so. Simply open your camera app on your phone and it will scan and send you the give page where you can easily give today or set up reoccurring giving. Also, for those that are near the church, if you would like to put your check in the offering box, there is a secure box outside the breezeway of the church. Have a great day. And remember, no matter what's going on, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We want to pray over the offering. Father, we thank you for those who were able to give and those that could not give. God, you know these are hard times now. Some are out of work, Lord. Some have not received a paycheck. But some people are still getting paid, God, and they are still giving the offering, God. We pray, God, that you would take the offering, God. Use it to your glory, your honor, and to your praises. We pray that it will be used to build up your kingdom down here on earth. We thank you in advance for being able to give, God, and not being able to give because, God, you don't measure us by what we give, but you measure it by uh, the sacrifice from our heart, God. And God, we thank you even right now for receiving our offering. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Now, I want to give the benediction before we leave, but I want to thank Pastor Stephan for that awesome word that he gave. Amen? Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, henceforth and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>